They were just going to throw away all of my in-transit equipment with them. So they were, they were forcing me to pay this money that I didn't authorize, or they were going to throw away all of my in-transit stuff that customers had already paid for, I had already paid for, and was in transit with them. And then bill me for it too. They're gonna bill me for those in-transit shipments as well. So I, I don't know. I mean, this is, I hate doing this. It's probably one of the things that I hate most about the job because I just don't really have control over it. We're gonna take some time talking about risk today. And as my cameraman brother just said, no risk, no reward. And that is not really the focus of uh, this video so much as it's more risk mitigation or you know hedging your bets, um, lowering your risk. And I've talked a lot about how your comfort level with risk should, well would and should get lower um, with time, right? With experience, with doing things over and over, something that seems risky in the beginning, maybe going on, uh, facing a fear of going on a roller coaster, right? That's way up in the sky. You only have a seatbelt or one strap holding you in and you do it a hundred times and you see all the other hundreds and thousands of people doing it and you get a comfort level. It's just, it's really not that risky. We're flying, right? There's all sorts of things. You think of risk generally as a monetary thing, like dealing with cash, dealing with money, taking risks. Um, but in business, there are a lot of different categories of risk in different areas of your business. And I wanna go through those and tell you how I mitigate those risks. And, uh, you know, I, I always like to think that if I'm, if I'm looking back 10 years in the future, looking back in this video that I, well, maybe some of my answers are the same, but I would like to think that I have a totally different perspective, right? That's 10 more years of experience that some things say, man, Courtney, you had no idea <laughs> what you were talking about, or that's great to see what you learned then and, you know, and then where I've, where I've come to that 10 year future me, you know? And, and so this is just a, a stopping or a, a data point along the journey. You know, I'm 41, almost 42. I've been self-employed for a while. I've started several businesses. I've bought business and sold business. I've worked for uh, big corporations, Fortune 250 corporations. I've worked for small businesses. I've just had a lot of experience and that's good and bad. You know, I've, I've um, well, working for myself has been the longest time I've been employed for anybody. <laughs> so I've, I've job hopped a bit and, and gone around and, and that's given me a lot of different insights too. Uh, a lot of good and, and some bad. And I try to capitalize on, on that experience. So anyway, the categories we're going to talk about today are going to be, uh, in no particular order, security. All right. Uh, labor, inventory, advertising, revenue streams, and then shipping, which is not going to apply to a lot of you, but it, well, maybe it will. It definitely applies to me. So I want to, I'll tack that one on towards the end. So uh, let's start with security. All right. And I just jotted down, I just got to, I opened up a when I do these videos, lots of times, not lots of times, sometimes when I do these videos, I open up just an email and I jot down some notes and I save it as a draft. And so then I just pull it up when I'm gonna do a video and go through it. And so the notes I jotted down for security were building, website, inventory, and insurance. So building security, actual physical security. So a year and a half ago, we bought a new building and it was empty for three years. It was at the, it was the only business in a business park. It's at the, the cul-de-sac at the end of the business park. A um, lot of vandalism around there, a lot of trash that gets dumped on that road. Even either while we were in the purchase process or right after we signed on it, you know, and go out to the property in the building before we'd moved in, somebody dumped a trailer load of trash right behind it. It's just, there was a homeless guy living in a shed behind our property. It, it, we needed security. And so I, I wanted to utilize the building, but we had three acres and I wanted to utilize the outside storage space as well. So we put a fence up with barbed wire on top. We put uh, high capacity or whatever, illumination, floodlights all the way around the building. We put security cameras, um, like the best ones I could find, a Vigilon, uh, which is another story but we put those all the way around and inside as well. We have a security system out there. We've got a junkyard dog. No, we don't, I keep thinking we should get a junkyard dog. That'd be kind of cool. But uh, we got a lot of layers of security out there and these are mostly one-time expenses, right? The gate 
or the uh, the fence has a gate we need some power we had to run power out there for that kind of thing but that's all said and done once it's there it's a one-time expense yes maybe there's some repairs or we have to replace something way down the road but once it's paid for it's there uh, security cameras we pay to have there's like some monitoring stuff that goes on with that security system was already there but we pay for a monthly service for that um the lights just an electric bill you know when they're on in the evening so there's major one-time expenses and then a little bit of recurring costs there but um it sucks to have to do that that doesn't add to the i'm not providing a value-added service to my customers to my my products for doing that so that's all risk mitigation um, and in some ways you need to have these things in order to be insurable. And so that's being insurable is a requirement to be in business. And so, um, it's different for everybody in every business and there's going to be different requirements that you need to do, but that was ours for the website. Okay. I, I, we don't, well, for a long time, we didn't have a physical storefront and my website was in essence, my physical storefront. And so you think of a mortgage on a building and a piece of property, well, paying for the website design and then the website maintenance um, as its own mortgage payment, basically, although it's a big one. Um, that's a huge animal to, to deal with. And so I have insurance actually in case my website gets hacked. And I know of others in, in the industry and, and folks that I've worked with that have had their uh, ransomware, uh, their website been down for months on end until they pay the ransomware or uh, a virus comes through and wipes things out. There's, there's huge interruptions. And, and for me, if my website went down, I mean, it's like, that's a, that's one of the biggest problems that I could think of that could happen to my business was my website going down. And so having a good team that's there to troubleshoot things, uh, working with good web partners with web servers and, uh, payment gateways and encryption companies and, and everything else on top of having insurance for business disruption insurance in case my website does go down is critical to me. Inventory. All right. So, uh, security for that, that comes into play with all the, the levels for the building that we talked about and then insurance for that equipment as well. So if there was a fire, um, or if somebody plowed through the gate and brought in, I don't know, a big semi trailer and loaded everything up and all the way, you know, something crazy. Uh, we have coverage for that. Right. And so, um, again, all of these costs have to be accounted for, right? This is, this is, this is trying to run a business and make a profit and still account for all of these costs. And I'm just getting started. I mean, it's, it's nuts to think about. So the, the investment that you have to make, the bigger that you get, right? And this didn't happen overnight. This has been an evolution. I started as a hobby selling tractors out of my garage and then moved it into a part-time business and got a storage space down the road and was outsized, you know, outgrew that for like two years and three years, whatever it was, until it was, we finally moved and found a place and, and got settled in. But this didn't all happen overnight. All right. So I, you know, no matter where you're at in the stage, right. If you're just planning, if you're, if you're where I was at as a hobby, if you're where I was at as a part-time, where I was at working out of a, a storage space, or maybe you're way beyond me, right. Hopefully there's just a nugget of information or maybe some reassurance assurance is all you need um, to know that you're on the right track or to make those wheels start turning in your head and, and taking a different direction. That's something that I find oftentimes, right. If I listen to a whole book, Maybe there's just one idea or one concept that I found that related to me and it makes the whole book worthwhile listening to um, because it turns my head in, into a different direction and lets me explore a whole new avenue or a whole new path that either I didn't think was worth doing or I never knew about or whatever. All right, so labor. Let's talk about the risk involved with labor, all right? And I've got the notes. Hiring, okay? I like when to hire folks. Redundancy, interesting one. Growth and then giving up bits of control. I'd like to start with giving up bits of control. And so again, this being my business from the ground up, I had all the control. I had every responsibility for every decision that was made. And then at the end of the day, it's, it's my company. And, and at least I like to think I still have <laughs> power and control over every decision being made. But at the end of the day, when you start hiring employees, you want to empower them. You, you have to let go of some of that and understand that they are not you and they are never going to do things the same way that you are. Even if you tell them the exact same way, you got to give up some of that control. And inherently that comes with risk that 
they're going to know enough about your business, about how you, the concept of how you want to run your business, the standards that you're looking for, and let them do it in their own way. As long as the main objectives, the things that are important align with your goals and with your character and with your, your, your principles, then it's something that I still struggle with, I guess is where I'm at. So I, I say these things out loud sometimes just to reiterate what I need to work on. So let's talk about hiring in general. Hiring my first employee was the hardest one. Um, for a long time, I thought I never wanted any employees. And I could have kept my company to that size. It would have been severely limited, right? There's only so much you can do with your own time. And it's the most profitable time if you know how to use it. When you hire somebody else, you can make more money, but it's less profitable. That makes sense. It doesn't mean you shouldn't grow, right? I, I have now found it to be a good responsibility to, to hire folks, to, to provide jobs. I try to provide really good wages. I try to provide really good benefits, um, a really good working environment. I want to be as flexible as I can. I want it to be a place that you would never want to leave. Um, but it's tough, right? Finding the right employees is tough. Taking a risk anytime you hire one is tough. You never know. We've had a lot of, not a lot, we had a few folks come through that look great on paper, look great in interviews, and you find out the first day or week that, boy, that is, I don't, you're a really good actor. So hiring is tough. I don't have a great answer for that other than we do seem to be getting better at it the more that we do it. Um, each position that you hire, I feel like you need to be able to justify their existence. And that means maybe you're hiring a new sales guy, right? Well, that's an easy one because you can correlate increased sales to hiring that sales guy, you know? But if I'm hiring um, maybe just another warehouse position that's, we've already got four guys out there packing up shipments and I'm gonna hire a fifth one, well, why am I doing that? And so that's where it leads me into the topic of redundancy. And that's on a couple of of fronts. And so the first level of redundancy is in case we do have to let somebody go or somebody quits or somebody's sick or somebody wants to go on vacation. My business can't be dead in the water and we're just not shipping out orders because so-and-so isn't there that day or that week. I need to have the manpower there in order to still get the work done. Customers don't care. So it's, it's just this crazy juxtaposition of customers always wanting <laughs> the cheapest price, the best value, and the business having to roll up all of these costs and account for things and still make money. I'm not working for free. I want to make a profit. And so it's just this, you know, if I hire a whole other guy just to have him there for when things go wrong, that's thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars out of my pocket just as my own insurance policy for that. So on the same concept, I want the redundancy because I don't want any one person at my business to be the only person that knows how to do anything. I want there to be a minimum of two people that know how to do everything from packing up orders to work on a forklift to um, answering a phone to printing a shipping label to whatever it is, right? It, 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 it doesn't matter what it is. And for the most part, we have a lot more redundancy than that. But I'm just saying, look at your business. If you've got one person that knows how to do whatever it is, that's a huge business risk. And so that's one of the other reasons why, you know, and it's been tough to find good employees. It is getting easier through the pandemic. It was brutal to find good employees. Um, the market is changing and, and shifting a bit. So it's making that easier, but um, it also helps you account for growth, right? You're either growing or you're shrinking. So it, you're, you're just not staying level. That's impossible to do. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. And if you have the mindset, you're going to get better. And even I think having that extra employee there, for example, helps you plan or maybe even put pressure on yourself to keep that growth going, right? And so that can be a good thing um, because you're, you're, you can't stay even. That's just not realistic. So uh, for me, I'm always planning on growing. Okay, inventory, next one, all right? And so uh, we already talked about insuring the inventory, but I'm talking about buying inventory. I hate inventory. I hate it. I love it you got to have things to sell, but I hate it. Tie up a lot of money in inventory, right? And it's the old 80-20 rule. You got 
20% of the stuff that does 80% of the sales, and you got 80% of the stuff that makes up 20%, right? And the problem is, is that that's sometimes a moving target. And for me, I have to order my seasonal equipment way in advance. And in fact, we interrupted this video to talk to one of the manufacturers because an order's got to get placed now. They're already out until March. And every time I put it off another day, it affects the, the arrival date, the estimated arrival date of when the equipment comes in the spring. I have to do all of this based on what I think is going to happen next year. I have to, this order is probably, I don't know, it's uh, about a million bucks, give or take, that I have to risk. I'm putting, uh, risking that I'm going to sell this stuff next year on the certain sizes and models and configurations, all that kind of thing. Plan for growth, plan for shrinkage. I, I don't know. I mean, this is, I hate doing this. It's probably one of the things I hate most about the job because I just don't really have control over it, right? I mean, I can manipulate things in some ways, but at the end of the day, I don't have a ton of control. And some products sell themselves, and I like to think all my products do, but from season to season, the size of attachments change that people want. You know, like I, I could have 48, 60, 72, 84, 96 in box blades, and last year we couldn't keep enough 48s in stock. This year, it was 60s and 72s, and 48s we were fine on. It's Why? And what changed from year to year? So when you have to carry all of this different stuff, it's, uh, it, it's troubling. So I've been working for myself to come up with a solution to this, and it's not perfect, and it's not foolproof, but working with manufacturers to try to um, sort of do an on-demand, right? And sometimes they have certain high-volume products at the manufacturer's facilities that they have in stock, and when you guys placed orders or when customers place orders, we can just send the order into the factory and then ship it right to you. And then a lot of other ones are going to have pretty quick lead times, you know, two, three weeks, sometimes one, two weeks, sometimes four weeks. In the pandemic, things were three, four, five, six months at certain points. Most things are not that long anymore. There's certain products that still are. Um, and so that's becoming more attainable to do that with the right manufacturers the agricultural industry in general is very old school. It's like a lot of it's stuck in the 1950s and 60s, kind of like the show Mad Men. I don't get it. And those are the companies where, when I said you're either, you're either growing or you're, or you're dying, those are the companies that are, in my opinion, going to be dying unless they change. It's just an archaic way of doing business. And they need to be able to change with the times or I'm going to leave them in the dust. Um, so that's an aspect of risk that, again, a business owner carries and you need to figure out a solution to manage. And that's how I'm trying to manage and get around that, that risky area there. Next topic. All right. Revenue streams, a little bit of diversification. If you only have one way that you generate income, that is a huge business risk. And that would keep me awake at night. If uh, there's only one way that I made money because not only is that my income and my business and reflective of all the time and the years and the hours that I put into it, it's also all my employees, right? I have a responsibility to get them a paycheck week in and week out forever. They have families, they have their own bills, they have life, they have everything else going on. And so I take that responsibility seriously. And so I want to mitigate that risk and you should too. And even if you're not looking at it as risk mitigation, you should look at it as growth opportunity because times always change, all right? And what's good now may be good in the future, but it may not be. And you really don't have a way to know that. Predictions are only predictions. They are not guarantees. And so if you can have different avenues of uh, creating income, uh, creating revenue for your business, then you're better off, right? I use attachments as one. I actually started off selling just tractors. That was my revenue stream when I was back when it was a hobby and a part-time business. But then folks wanted attachments, and so I got to offering attachments as well as tractors. And so that's two different revenue streams, right? That you have one bucket selling a tractor, you have another bucket selling attachments. When somebody buys both, fantastic. Um, but there's two different markets because you have folks that are shopping for tractors, and then you have a huge pool of folks out there that already have tractors and need different attachments for new projects or tasks that they have to do around their house. So that's two different avenues there. And then I have companies that I work with that I don't want to carry their products. I already have enough as it is. 
And we do affiliate relationships or partnerships where you can use a discount code. I don't, I don't have to worry about stacking all the 500 things that they sell. You can go right to their website that's already set up and laid out and has the pricing and everything else. And I can still advertise it like I'm selling the product, like I, something I physically carry, but it's just, you deal directly with them. And, and some of these products, I, I know enough to be dangerous, but I don't know the products in and out like the back of my hand. And Summit Hydraulics is a good example. I can explain hydraulics to you, but knowing every fitting and, and every way, everywhere to plug something in on an electrical side of things or whatever it is and how to make it all work, you're much better off going right to the source, the company that made, designed, manufactures these hydraulics solutions than going through me. And so that's like a perfect example of where I can still advertise and show you guys about it um, because that's kind of my niche is showing all these folks things that are hopefully helpful and handy and, uh, and productive. And then you can buy it through their site, save some money with a discount code. I can still get a commission off of it that way. And then if you need the support, you can talk directly to the source, which is your best way to get information and support. So, um, you know, affiliate stuff, uh, uh, tractors, tractor attachments, uh, sponsorships with RimGuard. We're sponsored by RimGuard. Um, used to be with Bora, and you know we mix things up over time, right? And that's another good revenue stream there. And they just all kind of build up, right? So that's not saying all these things necessarily apply right to your business, but you need to look for those different buckets or those different streams. Maybe it's slow in one category because of the seasonal thing or uh, maybe you're back ordered, can't get supply or for a variety of reasons. And when one's down, maybe another one's picking up or at least helping you stay above water, right? So that's a very important thing that no matter what your business is, even if it's, even if it's a service business, you can still diversify revenue streams in a service business too. It doesn't have to be physical inventory. All right, this one, <clears throat> advertising, that is a risk that... Um, you gotta, you gotta put the money out there. So, I mean, there's, yes, there's free ways to advertise and I would encourage anybody to take advantage of social media. Uh, that's, I actually didn't start out on YouTube because I was advertising or wanting to advertise. I started out on YouTube because frankly, I was tired of answering the same question over and over and over and over. And so um, I started making videos on how to do certain things or what certain things are or whatever, just common topics that came up that people asked. And so I had a nice, complete, clear video that encompassed all the information that I wanted to share. And I could just send a video link and say, hey, here's a, here's a great thorough answer. Here's, this should be everything you need to know. Instead of having to type out a long, draw out email or have a conversation where I can't remember half the things I said yesterday. So, I mean, it's way easier to have a, a reference, a permanent reference there um, that you can just go back to and check time and time again. Saves me a lot of time. Again, getting back to the, oh, there's only so much time in the day. And then that just kind of evolved into a whole marketing thing. My first like 200 videos or something, you couldn't even see my face on camera. Part of that's because I was holding it. And two, I didn't think anybody wanted to see my face. They probably still don't. And three, I didn't have, you know, I, I started using a tripod and getting my face on there. Uh, somebody recommended I do that. And then it just kind of evolved. So had no no clear path that, that was going to be a, a um, an advertising method but that's one of the cheapest ways that you can do it and you're going to have to find what sticks and what clicks for you it could be youtube could be facebook could be instagram could be whatever um, the other platforms don't work nearly as well for me as uh, facebook does and youtube so the other ways are paid advertising right facebook ads google ads youtube ads print ads all sorts of ways to pay, right? And there are, for me, ways that are way better than other ways. And uh, a lot of that's trial and error. You gotta spend some money for a certain amount of time and find out if it's working for you or not. And then you can always dial it back in, but that is a risk that you're taking. You have to have, this is where like a budget number for your advertising spend comes into play. So you can have kind of your, your staples of what you know you're gonna spend money on. And then you have a little bit of that leftover stuff where you can go experiment and see if there's any of these other avenues or any other methods of getting the word out there about your product, if any of those work. And then that's how you can explore and expand and really uh, push those limits then if you do find some new way to advertise and, and collect eyeballs to your website or to your business. All right, final one for you. Those of you in 
the shipping world that you have to deal with UPS, with FedEx, with LTL freight, with freight haulers. Well, I deal with all the above, all right? We send a lot of stuff, UPS ground, a ton of stuff. We send a lot of stuff LTL freight, like the semi trucks, you know, where you put stuff on a pallet and they're delivering things all over the place. And then we sell or, or sell a lot of things, a uh, hot shot, right? Whether that's uh, could be tractors or it could be oversized pieces of equipment. Generally speaking, if it's something is eight foot or longer in a certain dimension and the width of the length, then we're going to put that on a hot shot. There's sometimes certain routes, certain carriers that will take uh, pieces of equipment that are eight foot. They charge a big oversized charge to do so. Um, so we'll weigh those pros and cons and sometimes still send them on a hot shot trailer versus LTL freight. But shipping is a big risk. And unsurprisingly, I have a whole separate insurance poly policy just for freight. And so again, this cost has to be accounted for. Every, you know, when you see the price of a product on my website, I'm doing things the right way, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I am, I am not going to be a fly by night. I'm not going to be a leave you hanging out to dry type of dealer, right? I mean, I, I try to partner with good manufacturers. I try to partner with good freight carriers. I try to have good employees. I want to do things the right way. I want to be, you know, I want to treat you how I want to be treated. And so part of that is also is having all of the, the reassurance behind the scenes to be able to do that. Um, and so that's where that comes into play too. But we've gone through a lot of freight carriers over the years. I've learned a lot of lessons, had a lot of bad things that have gone on um, that are big costs that I had to eat, you know? And, and one of them, and I'm gonna put this out there um, just because I think it's worth warning you folks about, but years ago, I worked with a company called Central Transport. They have a yellow uh, color scheme, just plain yellow on their trucks. They're based out of Detroit, I think it is. Super cheap. They're about the cheapest freight company that's out there in the industry. And now I had dealt with freight companies working for other businesses, never with, with this company in particular. Seems to be sort of commonplace in the industry, which I think is kind of um, misleading. But this company apparently is known for doing this. So they're dirt cheap. And then what they try to do is get you on all sorts of other charges later on. And so I had, uh, I was doing a decent amount of business back, back then. I don't know. This was, this was years ago. I can't remember the year exactly. I had roughly $50,000 worth of shipments that were in transport to various locations. All right. W within the central transport system, going all over the country, different hubs, different terminals, blah, 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 blah. And I received a bill from them for, I can't remember if it was 12 grand, if it was 15 grand, 20 grand. It was somewhere in there. Just let's just say fifteen thousand dollars, with a long, 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 long list, pages long list of liftgate charges for all these customers. And I started going through it. And I was like, well, number one, what what is this about? Why are these only liftgate charges? And then I started going through the list and looking at the first name and going back to their order. And they didn't order a liftgate. And going to the next one, and they didn't order a liftgate. But there were all these hundred or hundred and fifty dollar liftgate charges or whatever the heck it was that were on there that people didn't authorize. And so I, I call Central Transport, I'm like, this is a mistake. I know these, I didn't put these, I, I didn't request lift gates on these bill of lading. I mean, here's copies right here, no lift gates requested. Customers didn't pay for it. So yeah, well, we called the customer and we're gonna arrange delivery and we just asked them if they want a lift gate. It's okay. And then they say, yes, we bill you. And I said, how can you guys do that? I said, oh, you know, look in your contract here, blah, 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 somewhere buried in some vague line where it's like, it doesn't say if a customer wants a lift gate, we're going to bill you for it. It's like you authorize central transport, you know, to have your first child if they want it. I mean, it was basically some stupid, vague language like that. And that's what they were hanging their hats on. I said, I'm not paying this. I didn't authorize any of these. These customers didn't pay for it. And these charges were, the, were like from the last six months. All right. So a huge chunk of time, like you expect me to go to hundreds of customers here and request to be paid reimbursed for something that you didn't tell them there was a cost associated with and you're just billing me for it. And they said, yeah, I said, I'm not paying that. And they said, well, you know, I mean, you gotta get escalated, blah, blah, blah. So I went through layer after layer after layer. <laughs> they eventually told me that if I don't pay the bill by this date, whatever the heck it was, they are 
taking all of my in-transit shipments and taking it to a, basically the junkyard and they're throwing them away. They were just going to throw away all of my in-transit equipment with them. So they were, they were forcing me to pay this money that I didn't authorize, or they were going to throw away all of my in-transit stuff that customers had already paid for, I had already paid for, and was in transit with them. And then bill me for it too. They're gonna to bill me for those in-transit shipments as well. So I learned a lesson there, which I don't know, you know, you always, you can't blame anybody but yourself. I don't, even looking back on it, I don't know how I would have known to, to come up with a scenario like that. Like in my head, if I was doing risk mitigation planning, like, okay, what would happen if such and such happened? How would I even dream up a scenario of, okay, you central transport are going to, what are you going to do? You're going to go ask customers if they want to lift gate and then bill me for it. I mean, I don't know how I would even have known that. So that was a expensive business lesson of, you know, I don't know, 15 grand or whatever it was plus or minus that, uh, I got to learn and I have taken that with me in the future. And I cross-reference everything right away as soon as I get a bill and see, and I have my, and my new language now is that I do not authorize any additional charges, right? So I've, I've mitigated that risk in the future, but there's certain things that you just really, you don't know until you find out. And sometimes it's too late. And sometimes you realize there's other companies out there that aren't going to do business the right way. And Central Transport's one of them. I would encourage all of you to never do business with them. Don't work for their company. That um, is a shady, unethical way of doing business. And I learned a pretty good lesson there. So folks, there's a look at risk in different areas of business. Hopefully there was something here that was helpful for you, no matter what stage of business you're in. And if there's other areas, I'm sure there's other areas. If you got some helpful advice, leave some comments down below and you're not helping just me, but there's a lot of folks that watch these videos and read through the comments and look for that encouragement and, and insight. So please share it if you have the knowledge to share. And if you're looking for a tractor or tractor attachments, well, that's what we do here. So go to goodworkstractors.com, see what we have to offer. We ship nationwide. I want to thank you for taking time out of your day to stop by. And until next time, stay safe. We'll see you soon.